We continue now with our study of Luther and the Reformation, and we come to the segment of our study where we're going to look uh, initially at the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification. Before I do that, let me just begin by saying that in my experience, I've found that the vast majority of people who call themselves Protestants have no earthly idea what it is they're protesting. If I say to them, why are you Protestant rather than Catholic, they will say things like, well, I don't believe I need to confess my sins to a priest, or I don't believe the Pope's infallible, or I don't believe in the uh, (coughs) uh, bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven, or things of this sort. When Desiderius Erasmus wrote uh, his diatribe against Luther and Luther responded to him, he thanked Erasmus for not attacking him on matters that Luther considered to be trivial, but that he addressed the very heart of the issue of the Reformation, which was the question, how does a sinner find salvation in Christ? Luther asserted that the doctrine of justification by faith alone, as we've already seen, is the article upon which the church stands or falls, and that this issue was not a tempest in a teapot, but touched the very core and the heart of the biblical teaching of salvation. And so we don't want to get bogged down in extraneous issues that perhaps could have been resolved with further meetings and discussions, but uh, focus on this one issue that was the point over which Christendom was severely fractured uh, and fragmented even to this day. Now, part of the problem of the doctrine of justification and the distinction that goes between historic Protestantism, the Reformation, and Roman Catholic thought has to do with the very simple meaning of the word justification itself. The English word justification is derived from the Latin term justificare, which etymologically and originally meant literally to make righteous. And so the early Latin fathers who studied the Bible out of the Latin Vulgate rather than out of the Greek New Testament, developed their doctrine of justification based on their understanding of the legal system of the Roman Empire, which used the word justificare, meaning to make righteous. And so as the church developed that doctrine, the idea of justification came to address the question of how is an unrighteous person, such as a fallen sinner, able to be made righteous? And so in the development of the doctrine of justification in Rome, the idea emerged that justification occurs after sanctification. That is, in order to be made just, we have to first of all be sanctified to that point that we exhibit a righteousness that is acceptable to God. The Protestant Reformation following after uh, the uh, revival of the study of antiquities focused attention on the Greek meaning of the concept of justification, which was the word dukiosunai, which means to declare righteous, not so much to make righteous. And in Protestantism, justification was understood to come before the process of sanctification. So early on, there was a complete difference of the order of salvation between the two communions. I've already mentioned to you that from the Roman perspective, justification is a function of the sacerdotal operations of the church. That is, 
that justification takes place primarily through the use of the sacraments. And it starts, of course, with the sacrament of baptism. So the first step in justification, according to Rome, is through the sacrament of baptism. And the sacrament of baptism, among others, is said to operate by Rome ex opere operato, which is translated theologically to mean through the working of the work. That is, Protestants have understood this to mean that <clears throat> baptism works, as it were, automatically. That is, if a person is baptized, that person is ex opera operato, placed in a state of grace or in a state of justification. Now, the Roman Catholic Communion is quick to become Protestant at that point itself by saying, no, 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 we don't like to use the word automatic because there has to be a certain predisposition in the recipient of baptism, at least not having any hostility towards the reception of the sacrament for it to function. But in any case, there is a very high view of the efficacy of baptism to bring about the change of the person's status into that of being placed into a state of grace, because in the sacrament of baptism, grace is said to be infused. Key word during the Reformation controversy, that grace is infused or poured into the soul. Now, if you would press Roman Catholic theologians to define what they mean by grace, they would be careful not to define it simply as some kind of substance, spiritual or material, but nevertheless the language of their sacramental theology uses quantitative uh, terms of grace, that you can have an increase in this infused grace or a diminution. That is, you can lose some of this substantial infused grace. And it is spoken of as something that inhabits or resides in the soul. Whereas when Protestants speak about grace, they usually describe grace as an action of God of benevolence and charity towards people that is unmerited. Now, we do st believe in Protestantism of being infilled by the Holy Spirit, but that's not quite the same thing that what is in view here with the Roman doctrine of baptism. That is, the grace and the righteousness of Christ is poured into or infused into the soul of the person at baptism, as a result of which that person is in a state of grace, at least conditionally, because for that uh, justifying grace to be efficacious, ultimately, the person who receives it must assent to that grace or that infusion of grace and to cooperate with that grace. At the Council of Trent in the sixth century, when the Roman Catholic Church defined her position dogmatically over against the protests of the Reformers. They used the terms uh, cooperare et assentare, to cooperate with and assent to the grace that is being bestowed here in the sacrament of baptism. Now, having possessed the infused grace of baptism, and if one assents to that infusion and cooperates with that infusion, that person is then in a state of grace and is a state in a state of justification. However, that justification that is re received through 
the infusion of the righteousness of Christ or of justifying grace is by no means immutable. It can change, and with the change, that grace that has been received in the sacrament of baptism may be lost. In fact, it may be lost entirely, removing the person from a state of justification and to be under the very threat of damnation. And that mutation or loss of saving grace takes place when the person commits a particular type of sin. And that type of sin is described by Rome as mortal sin. Mortal sin is distinguished from venial sin. Venial sin is sin. It is real sin, but it is a less serious type of sin than mortal sin. A mortal sin is more egregious. They make a distinction, for example, in Roman Catholic uh, moral theology with respect to drinking. To drink is not a sin inherently. To get tipsy is a venial sin. To get drunk is a mortal sin. Some moral theologians have even taught that to miss Mass on Sunday was a mortal sin. So there's not absolute universal agreement as to what constitutes mortal sin in the Roman Catholic Church, but there are many catalogs that have been produced historically that delineate various sins as being serious enough to be considered mortal. Mortal sin is called mortal because it is serious enough to cause the death of the justifying grace that has been infused to the person at baptism. Calvin in the 16th century, of course, objected to the distinction between mortal and venial as Rome had articulated it. Not that he denied the gradations of sin. The Reformers certainly believed that in the teaching of Jesus we find descriptions of greater and lesser sin. But Calvin would say that all sin is mortal in that it deserves death. In creation, the threat given to Adam and Eve was that the soul that sins shall die, and that even the smallest peccadillo is serious enough to be an act of treason against God's sovereign rule and is a serious matter and deserves death. But Calvin would go on to say, though every sin is mortal in the sense that it deserves death, no sin is mortal in the sense that it destroys the saving grace that a Christian receives at his or her justification. But this distinction and the effects of it between mortal and venial sin was a significant element here in the struggle of the 16th century. Well, what happens if a person who has been baptized, who's received the infusion of the grace of justification, the infused righteousness of Jesus, what happens if that person commits mortal sin and destroys that justifying grace? Well, all is not lost because there is an anecdote of, to that situation by, by which a person can be restored to the status of justification in the sight of God. And that also comes via a sacrament. In this case, it is the sacrament of penance, which the Roman Church in the 16th century defined the sacrament of penance as, quote, the second plank of justification for those who have made shipwreck of their faith. And so you see the nautical metaphor that is involved in that description. Those who have made shipwreck of the faith are those who have committed mortal sin and have lost the grace of justification. But happily, 
they can be restored through the sacrament of penance. And the sacrament of penance, as we've already seen in the indulgence controversy, was at the heart of the problem that erupted in the 16th century. Because penance had several elements to it, not the least of which was confession, an act of contrition, showing and demonstrating that your confession was not moved merely out of a fear of punishment, but out of a genuine a sorrow for having offended God. And that uh, confession and contrition is then followed by priestly absolution, whereby the priest would say to the penitent person, te absolvo, I absolve you. Now again, here's where we see a lot of misunderstanding and, and uh, caricatures arise within and among Protestants when they say, you know, I don't have to have a priest tell me that I'm absolved of my sin. I don't have to confess my sins to the priest. I can confess directly to God. I don't need the mediation of the saints or any such thing. And so that's where so many of the guns of Protestantism are aimed at, this, at the ritual elements involved in the sacrament of uh, <clears throat> penance. Not all of the Reformers were opposed to confession. The Lutherans carried on the act of confession because they believed, as the New Testament said, that we were to confess our sins one to another, that it's very uh, salutary for a Christian to confess their sins to somebody in a, uh, a situation where they will have their uh, confession protected by the discretion of the minister, and the minister has the authority to declare the assurance of pardon to those who are genuinely sorrow for, sorry for their sins. In our church here at St. Andrews, we frequently in our liturgy have a corporate confession of sin, after which we have the assurance of pardon, where we might say something that, that the Bible said, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and, and to cleanse you from all uh, uncleanliness and so on. And so for the Reformers, that wasn't the issue. The issue was the next step in the sacrament of penance. In order to be restored to the state of grace, one must perform works of satisfaction. Works of satisfaction. Here's where works come in. Now again, going back to the caricatures, if you'll hear Protestants say, what's the difference between you and Roman Catholics? Of Protestant will typically say, we believe that justification is by faith. The Catholic says it's by works. We believe it's by grace. The Catholics say it's by merit. We believe it's by Christ. They believe it is through your own self-righteousness. That's a, a, a terrible slander against Rome because Rome now and in the 16th century and always had said that justification requires faith and that justification requires the grace of God, and that justification requires the work of Jesus Christ. Where the debate and the dispute became so serious was over that little word alone, because the formula for Rome was that you have to have faith plus works. You had to have grace plus merit. You had to have Christ plus inherent righteousness in yourself. And, and so it were those pluses that became so problematic in the 16th century. Well, particularly with respect to that element of the sacrament of penance, where the penitent has to perform works of satisfaction. They may be somewhat simple works, such as saying so many Our Fathers or so many Hail Marys or giving restitution to your neighbor for having sinned against them, or even going on a pilgrimage, or giving alms, as we've discussed with respect to the uh, uh, indulgence controversy. But Rome is, uh, distinguishes strongly between different kinds of merit. We looked at that in passing earlier, but I want to remind you again of the distinction that Rome makes between uh, condign merit and congruous 
merit. Condign merit is merit that's so meritorious that it demands a reward. God would be unjust if He did not reward works that were condign and condignly meritorious. The merit that is acquired through the works of satisfaction in the sacrament of penance do not rise to the level of condign merit. Rather, the works achieved in the sacrament of penance are described by Rome as meritum de congruo, that is, congruous merit. It's real merit, but it's merit dependent upon previous grace, and it's merit that simply makes it congruous or fitting for God to restore the person to the state of grace. So, in other words, if a person went through the sacrament of penance and did the works of satisfaction prescribed by the priest, then it would be unfitting or incongruous for God not to restore that person to a state of justification. Of course, Luther saw the New Testament teaching of justification by faith alone as a thunderbolt against any kind of merit, condign or congruous, and that people should never think that any work that they do can in any way add to the satisfaction for our sins that has been accomplished by Christ and by Christ alone. But this is the initial way in which uh, justification is accomplished according to uh, the Roman system. However, we have to ask further and explore more deeply what the role of faith particularly is in this whole process of justification, and God willing, we'll do that in our next session.